Hi folks, welcome back. Uh, so this will be a, a lecture on the first chapter of Thobbit, uh, the book player's story. And this one is probably the heaviest in terms of theory, and it might have been a bit of a tough slog <laughs> for you to get through it, but uh, don't worry, things will get a lot easier as we, as we uh, go into the next chapter. But I do think there's some important points to discuss in this one. To start talking about this chapter, I thought it'd be good to start with this quotation that Thobber puts in from Roland Barthes. Well, you might have uh, might know that name. He's written a lot of uh, books about myths, and uh, the author. I think he's got an essay called "Death of an Author," <laughs> the death of the author, something along those lines. Uh, anyway, the quotation goes something like this: "There is not, there has never been anywhere, any people without narrative. All classes, all human groups have their stories, and very often those stories are enjoyed by men and women. I would say, of different and even opposite cultural back, uh, backgrounds." Uh, so this is, a, I think, a nice segue into, you know, why is even care about video game narratives? Why is care about narratives at all? And I think uh, this quotation from Barth sort of gets at it, right? Uh, we, we all tell stories. This is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be a human and to uh, be a member of any kind of society or culture anywhere. Uh, so it makes sense to try to understand what a narrative is and what functions do they serve, uh, why do we do these things, uh, so all those sorts of questions, but what we want to be asking as well is, you know, we have all these different ways to tell stories, right? Uh, short uh, books, uh, we could tell stories in films, uh, there are plays, all these different ways to tell stories. Is there anything special or unique about the video game as a storytelling device, as a, a narrative tool? And that's the sort of thing I want to be thinking about uh, as we go through the course. Okay, so in the next part, he talks about classifying game fiction. So, we've got all these different ways to tell stories, right? So, can we put games into any kind of category? He says yes. So, uh, here on, I don't know what page this is on, but he says game fiction is a type of performed narrative. And by that, he's talking about narratives like plays, films, or operas. Because in those, uh, there's some kind of performance involved in the storytelling as well as the substance of which the uh, game fiction is made. So if you think about a play, for example, you have actors up on stage, they're, per make, they're performing this, and that performance is kind of what a play is, right? Uh, so I, I think about uh, classes where you might read a play. Let's say you're reading Hamlet, and you might ask yourself, am I really uh, reading the play? Am I experiencing the play? And I think most uh, theater people would say no. You can read all those plays, but that's not nearly the same thing as actually going to a performance and seeing Hamlet on, up on stage. And I think in a way you can see how games are sort of similar to that, right? We've talked about you can't just read about a, playing a game. That's not the same thing as playing the game. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, video games are made of a mixture of written language, cinematic clips, cutscenes, in other words, pictures, graphics, and the three filmic soundtracks, dialogue, music, and effects. Uh, so I think this is, it makes sense to me anyway that you would put it into this uh, category. So let's uh, stop here for a moment and discuss this. So think about stage plays, films, or operas, uh, whichever one you want, and think about the ways it's similar to playing a video game, but also some ways that it's not. All right, so next he talks about the three levels of narrative, and this is uh, adapted from Herman and Verveik, who get it from uh, Jeanette, so I've gone back to all these sources and tried to get some, a little bit more clarity on these uh, levels. Uh, but my understanding is it goes something like this here. So you got the narrative, and that's the concrete stuff, the concrete ways that the story is told, surface level stuff, word choices, uh, all the stuff that's on the page basically as words. <laughs> uh, he says this is sort of the focalizer's location. And this term focalizer is definitely weird, but if you think about a short story uh, with a, and, and how you maybe they're describing events, people are having experiences. The focalizer could be the character uh, that is seeing and hearing everything and reporting back to you, right? So, so the focalizer is sort of how the, is the character that the reader uses or sort of, uh, uh, what's the word here, identifies with or maybe even um, enters into, I suppose, uh, to be able to surreptitiously uh, experience these events, right? Uh, then from that we have a step removed, more abstract, called the narration. So narrative was the first one, this is narration. Uh, they say this is the level that contains events and characters presented to the reader. Uh, so we're talking here about the perspective that's chosen, uh, the chronology, 
uh, the uh, basically the, where the narrator is in the story. So uh, again, there's some confusion here because there's lots of different types of stories. Uh, some of them will have a, a person, one character narrating the story, and it's very clear who that is. And uh, whereas there's all kinds of other narrators, third person omniscient, for example, uh, where it doesn't seem to be, you couldn't point at any particular character very easily and say, well, that must be the person that's seeing everything and reporting uh, back to me. It can be kind of hazy, right? Who's you know, the, the functions that are used? But uh, these authors are saying, even if there's not a character called a narrator, uh, and you can easily point to that character, nevertheless, uh, some kind of narrative, narrative function is going on, uh, whether that's uh, abstract or very concrete. Uh, so by this stage of narration, we're talking then about sort of choices that narrator has made. So as, a, as a, the narrator could decide to present the story, okay, we can start at the beginning and work our way to the end. So uh, from the baby up to the old elderly uh, person at the end of life, let's say. Uh, or you might say, well, no, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to start sort of in the middle, have some flashbacks, uh, flash forwards, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but anyway, all that sort of decision making uh, is the, at the level of narration. And then finally, the weirdest of all is the story, uh, which this is the most abstract, according uh, to this. Uh, it's not readily available to the reader, they say. Uh, so it's almost, to me, sounds like a kind of a platonic ideal of a story. And I might ask you about this, but to me this would be like, if let's say the story of Snow White, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, or the Three Little Bears, yeah, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? So if you imagine that as a story, you sort of know what happens in, to Goldilocks and the bears and the beds and all that. Uh, but nevertheless, so if you actually sat down with a, to a child and was trying to tell this story, uh, there's an infinite number of ways you could go about it, right? Just think about all the different word choices you could make as you're trying to tell this story. Uh, and then with the same thing with narration, would you start at the beginning you know where would you start it where would you end would you have those <laughs> flashbacks would you would there be a point in the story where you cut to the bears you know or would you just stick with the goldilocks the whole time uh, so that's kind of how i'm seeing this uh, so the story is this sort of that uh, the raw materials i guess of a goldilocks story and then the narrative and the narration are when you get by degrees more uh, concrete in the actual telling of it but anyway uh, i'm not 100 percent sure i got this right uh, so just let me know what your thoughts are on these three levels of narrative uh, and what do you make of it. All right, so I said we talk a little bit more about this idea of a focalizer and a narrator. Uh, so here on this page, I think we get a little bit more clarity. So the focalizer is who is seeing, who is hearing, who is experiencing the events uh, in that story, right? That's at the, again at the narrative level. Uh, and then uh, the, we have a narrator who is speaking or describing things to the reader, uh, the narrator being at the narration level. And they say uh, a couple things here, I think we'll clear this up a little bit. So with the narrator, they're saying, in texts, so a short story, uh, the narrator is often simply imagined to exist, anthropomorphized. So as I said before, some stories will have a character in there that says, hey, I'm the narrator, and I, you know, this is my story, and here's what happened. Uh, whereas other stories might have a different kind of narrator, where it's almost like the author is the one that's describing these things, not, the, not a character in the story, but the author. Uh, but in any case, uh, we tend to anthropomorphize this person, uh, which basically means we, we think of this as a person. It's kind of weird to try to think about it as something else, uh, so that's just a tendency. Uh, whereas in a game, uh, he says this narrator is a real human being. And in other words, it's, it's the player, as well as, uh, we'll get into in a moment, the game composition device. So focalizers and narrators are pretty strange concepts, and <laughs> it's, it's, it's complex, which is why they're whole books, whole courses you could take just on narrative. But I think that's the basic idea. So now we need to think about more about the video game, and who narrates a video game? Uh, so he makes the point here that when you're playing a game like Bioshock, uh, some parts are controlled by the player, but not all. And I really like the moment where he says that you can just take your hands off the controller, you can put down the mouse and keyboard, and there's still Careful. stuff going on. Would you kindly lower that uh, so what is that? How do we talk about this? And he's got some terminology that I think is very helpful. Uh, but before we go there, we need to talk more about film. 
Uh, so he says, uh, you know, we could talk about short stories and narrators and vocalizers in the short story, but really games are more like films than they are text short stories, right? Because we have all, all the stuff that he mentioned before. <laughs> it's dialogue, soundtrack, uh, camera angles, and all, the, all this kind of stuff. And he used, he's talking about a guy named John, or Jean, who has come up with the idea of a cinematic narrator, uh, which they call the FCD, FCD, Filmic Composition Device. The cinematic narrator, decision-making agency responsible for the showing. And uh, let me just read these quotes and then we'll talk a little bit about what, what this means. So according to Jean, uh, the quote, theoretical agency behind a film's organization and arrangement assumed to be guided by maxims of giving efficient, sufficient, and relevant information. So giving efficient, sufficient, and relevant information. Uh, the FCD selects what it needs from various sources of information and arranges, edits, and composes this information for telling a filmic narrative. A film shows us what the FCD has arranged for us to see. So think about next last time you watched a movie or a television show and if you ever tried to make your own videos and shows, you realize you have to decide at any given moment uh, what's going to be on the screen, right? Uh, and how are you going to tell this story? Uh, what, what, what kind of sound effects will there be? Uh, what kind of music is, is there going to be? Why are you showing all this stuff? And if you, go, if you look at uh, shows, you might wonder sometimes, well, why are they showing me the outside of this building? And so I was just watching a, an episode of Bones, actually, and I was... I had been uh, sort of thinking about these things, and I noticed one of the shots that showed you this, uh, uh, the front of the Natural History Museum, and then they kind of chose this, it seemed like you're kind of walking around the gate, and the gate is open, and you sort of wonder, uh, why are they showing me this? And of course, if you study film a little bit, you know, that's sort of the establishing shot. Uh, really, these, these actors are just on a soundstage somewhere, right? And not actually in this Natural History Muse uh, Museum, but by showing that, outside of it and then showing maybe the, a little bit of the inside hey, they sort of give you the idea that where they are they're inside this museum and that has a significance right so all of those kinds of decisions uh, Jean is calling the FCD or filmic composition device it's a little weirder than you might have realized if you really next time you watch next time you watch a movie or show really pay attention to what they're showing you at any particular moment I think you realize it's it's pretty weird sometimes but uh, it makes sense to us because we've seen so many films and shows that a lot of the stuff is just almost uh, ingrained within us. We no longer ask, well, why are they showing that? Uh, why are they showing this? Well, why this and not that? All right, so this is it needs to be adapted into something to, for uh, games because games are not films. Uh, so for that purpose, uh, Thaber wants to talk about the GCD, uh, Game Composition Device. <laughs> and for some reason, he doesn't seem to like this term. I don't get it. It makes sense to me. So he's saying, uh, sort of like the FCD, the GCD is a fictional world-creating agency that controls what the player does not. Other existence, characters and settings, I would call those NPCs, non-player characters, uh, events, actions and happenings, and the rules of a presentation. Uh, in other words, the, I guess everything that the player doesn't directly control. Uh, there's never a single voice and a single narrator in games, though, but rather two conflicting narrative voices, both narrating simultaneously. And so I think this is the key insight here, is that unlike a film uh, where, yes, the director, the camera operators, and all those people, of course, the actors, they're all making all these choices, and you, you see certain things on the screen, and it all sort of comes together into this uh, composition device. Uh, with the GCD, though, they can never quite get there, because you always have that co-narrator, namely you, uh, the person playing the game, right? So uh, you are, in fact, co-narrating uh, with this game composition device. So all of these other elements that he talks about here. So next he talks a little bit about tense in games. And I think this is an important thing to uh, think about in terms of game narrative. So we have uh, present tense as it's used in printed fiction. And you've probably read lots of uh, stories. Well, I think about horror stories tend to, to use this a lot, uh, where they're using present tense. So you might have something, maybe you've got a first-person narrative, so you might say, I walk into the house. I hear a creaking stairwell. I see cobwebs in the corner. You know, all this kind of stuff could be written down. And, you know, we've read stories like that, and it seems to make sense to us. Uh, but I think he's uh, right. If you really think about it, there's some weirdness with that. Uh, type of story 
Uh, for one thing, am I saying these things at the same time I'm doing them? Uh, so in other words, if the narration were really to coincide with the action, the narrator would be talking and experiencing at the same time. Uh, so is that what, what's happening there? You know, is this, am I in the house and I'm telling you that I'm in the house? Or am I just walking into the house? Am I saying I'm walking into the house? <laughs> and so there's just, we kind of understand, we, we can read these stories, but nevertheless, that is kind of a weird thing if you think about it. Uh, secondly, uh, it'd be impossible for the narrator to know the end of the story. So if this were really present tense and I'm really there and I'm just telling you what's going on as it's happening, uh, I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> at the end of this thing, right? Because it's, it's happening. Uh, whereas in reality, of course we know, I do, because I wrote the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's done. It's sort of a, an artifact now. Uh, so again, that's sort of a weird thing. Now it says with games, though, we can do these things that we can only do, sort of, we only sort of imagine. It's kind of weirdly maybe. Uh, with a game, though, it can be literal, uh, literally happening. So in other words, think about the present tense. If you play Bioshock, this stuff is really going on as you're playing it, right? It's not your, I think you're not telling about it later. You know, you're actually there playing the game. And second, you don't know how it's going to end. So whereas the author knows the ending of the story, uh, I guess it could be stream of consciousness, but let's uh, put, <laughs> not think about that for now. Uh, but you know, it's, it's done. It's a done deal, right? The book is a done deal. Uh, whereas if you're playing a game, you really don't know how it's going to end. You could get killed <laughs> you know, by a splicer <laughs> at the end. Uh, or you can make it all the way through to the game. Uh, and then he talks more about the focalizers in games and how they're different from film. And, you know, by the way, film is uh, talk, talking a little bit more about this GCD. It is interesting if you notice, uh, if you study film, maybe you've had some film study courses, and you know there's a lot of work that's been done on uh, the type of camera angles that are chosen and uh, they're, they're called, like, what they call suturing. So the idea that you can sort of maintain, a, uh, I guess, the immersion of watching this film, even though they're switching between different characters. So maybe you've got a Bones talking one moment and she's saying things and she's still talking but they switch to Booth so you can see Booth's reaction uh, to what she's saying. And there's all kinds of stuff that takes place like that as you're watching a film. Uh, but nevertheless, you're sort of able to watch it anyway and you kind of wonder who's the focalizer. Uh, sometimes it seems like you're like a little bug on the wall uh, watching all this stuff. Other times though, it seems like you're sort of temporarily inside the, a character's mind uh, but anyway, it's weird enough in films. So now he's talking about, though, in games. And again, in some ways, it's easier to understand how it works in a game than it is a film. And this example, I think, is really interesting. Uh, so the, the film Gran Torino with Clint Eastwood. Uh, it's, it's funny, I was, it was, the movie was just on the other day, and I was uh, re-watching it, and I just read this, so it was, it was kind of weird. that. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, so imagine that character Walt in this story. He's kind of a bigoted guy, right? Uh, so if you had a game called Gran Torino, you know, the game, what a weird concept. But anyway, if you had this game and you're playing as Walt, uh, then you, let's say they said, okay, press the A button or the W button or whatever, and you can make him say something uh, derogatory, some kind of uh, bigoted statement. Now, would you feel compelled just to keep pressing it and try to be as much like Walt in the film as possible? Or would you say, you know, I, didn't, I, I would never do that. You know, I would never make a comment like that, so I'm just never going to press the button. Uh, so this kind of gets us into this point, right? Can you separate your own values and interests when playing uh, a game like this? And he seems to think you can't, uh, that there's always, you're always going to have your own values and uh, your own interests, and they're not going to be the same as any character from a film, no matter how hard you try to be just like Walt. So anyway, we'll bracket that for a moment. Uh, now we want to delve a little bit deeper into this distinction between a player and a reader. And so always our own narrative. So uh, we're going to get into the, the idea that, again, the book is a done deal. Uh, the game, though, you're playing this, you can make all kinds of decisions. So he says here, uh, by controlling the camera, etc., we talked about it, the GCD, the player sees what he or she wants. The player's own values are at work. The player's own interest is most valuable in a game narrative. Uh, so thinking about this camera again, with, not all games have this option, of course, but a first-person game, you're basically like the camera, you're looking around. Uh, with a game like uh, Bioshock, uh, there's lots of details in the settings, and lots of slogans, flags, paintings, all sorts of stuff, and you can decide 
whether to look at that, whether to look at it long enough to read it, whether just to skip it. Same thing with all those audio logs and everything uh, sitting around there. Uh, it's sort of up to you. Are you interested in the audio logs? Uh, then you can click on that and hear it. If you're not, hey, you just move on through the story. And I was thinking, uh, you know, again, thinking about these other performed narratives. One thing that always struck me about seeing a film uh, versus seeing a stage play is if you're watching the, the stage play, you don't, you could look, sit there and stare at the actor that's giving the lines of dialogue at that particular moment. Or you could decide, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to look over here at this other actor that's not, it's just sort of in the background right now. Or maybe I just want to look at the scenery for a while. You know, you certainly have more choice when you go to a stage play. Uh, whereas with a film, you might just have that close up of the actor giving the dialogue. You don't have the option to look at something else. That's what's on the screen, right? So I think with a game, it's even more freedom. Uh, to maybe even in the stage play to decide this, because I could decide who gets to talk sometimes, right? Or what, what the characters say. But anyway, back to traditional fiction. So he says, unlike traditional fiction, in which we read about or watch the conflict of a protagonist and an antagonist, and in which our response occurs only inside our more or less empathizing, empathizing minds, in game fiction, the conflict is more palpably our own as we find ourselves inside the protagonist's body. The story becomes a personal experience that tells us about ourselves much more uh, than about the protagonist. And, you know, as I was reading this, uh, you, again, thinking about horror stories, uh, if you watch a horror story or maybe even uh, watch a horror film, uh, you're sort of always aware these are other characters, right? Uh, that's not me in the film. Although if, I think if you identify, like he's saying here, you empathize, I guess, enough with those characters, it can feel like you're there. And definitely when something jumps out and scares you, you know, you have a real reaction. Uh, it's not just the characters on the screen. Uh, but I do think there's a difference. If you played uh, horror games, and some of you said you were very scared playing uh, Bioshock. Uh, I remember one called uh, Doom 3. <laughs> I tried to play this game. It's just terrifying. Uh, namely because you, uh, you really feel like, you know, having control of that character may, somehow makes it scary. At least to me, it's a lot scarier because you're the one in control uh, versus just watching this. If you watch uh, somebody else playing it, or you just saw the movie Doom, they're completely different. I mean, they're both scary, but to me, it, I think he's onto something here. This, this seems more personal because uh, it's you in there. And I can only imagine the future, you know, as we get into this VR stuff and a uh, Vive, and how much even more palpable it's going to be the experience that, hey, that's really me in there. All right, so I think we've uh, talked enough here. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are on all this stuff. And uh, if, if some of it was confusing, I apologize for that. You know, <laughs> but, uh, Things will definitely get better with the next chapter, so just, just hang in there. And again, let me know if you have any questions or comments. And see you next time.